Do you want to know how you can speed up your sales cycle so that you can close more deals year on year? Well, this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Ron Carr. He's a sales expert. You can find out more about him over at roncar.com. His book, Lead, Sell, or Get Out of the Way, is available on Amazon. And on this episode, we're diving into speeding up our sales cycle. Very simply, so we can close more deals easier and quicker throughout the year. And a lot of this, interestingly, is based around just having better conversations and asking better questions. So with all that said, let's jump in to today's show. Ron, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm very well. I'm glad to have you on. I'm glad to dive into a topic which I think is going to have real practical value for the audience. So none of this wishy-washy mindset stuff that we've been talking about recently, real practical sales uh, process advice. We're going to be talking about speeding up the sales cycle. So I want to start off with here, and I genuinely don't know the answer to this question, and it might be both. But to speed up the sales cycle, should we be focusing on reducing the length of it so people can get through it quicker or very physically pushing people past each step within it quicker? My whole work is about reducing the sales cycle for an organization or someone who's in sales. But when I look at reducing the sales cycle, what I'm looking at is if people can qualify more effectively up front, they'll come to a decision really fast whether or not they want to waste more time with that client or not. That's number one. And by qualifying it effectively up front, while it may take more time in the initial call, they're going to get a lot more information that then is going to help them target the presentation around solutions that the prospect is looking for. So to speed up a sales cycle, number one, you got to qualify better. But number two, you need to ask the right questions up front, which may take longer. But if you do it right, it will significantly reduce the overall sales cycle. Has this got easier or more difficult in the fact that it's harder to get people's time or seemingly harder. Uh, if you if you listen to the uh, salespeople who are kind of emailing me complaining, which is you know never good to just complain about stuff and not come up with a potential solution. And also when you listen to the sales experts in the space as well, and, and multiple research reports kind of have, have alluded to this, but is this getting harder to spend time with someone to do this initial upfront research than you know, perhaps it was five, 10 years ago, now that perhaps we're joining them later on in the buying cycle, perhaps they think they know what they need more um, than, what we, than what we would have been in the conversation prior. I don't think it's hard. I mean, I just had a client that I'm on retainer with yesterday share with me that he went on a new sales call and um, he was using the process we just talked about and the client had 30 minutes set for the meeting and it went 45 minutes. And the funny thing he said was, I never even talked about my own products. It was asking those questions about where that client wanted to go, what the challenges were. And it was about them, not about me. And therefore, they were really interested. But I think what you have to look at is, number one, are you meeting with the right prospect? Meaning, do they have a need for what you're looking at, number one? Number two, are you meeting with the right decision maker? And number three, is the timing right? I mean, the timing is not right then nothing's going to work because, you know, at the end of the day, people are really tied up with what they're doing for that day, that week. And if the purchase decision is not going to be made for another six months and it's not a long sales cycle, then you're best coming back at the time that's most appropriate. And is this an opportunity to potentially even add value to the people within our, our pipeline, the people that we're prospecting in, well, on two fronts? One, if we can interact with them at the right time, we're going to save them time, energy, and that perhaps could differentiate us from the competition who are just trying to close the deal now, who are pushing it and getting people's backs up. But then also, is this an opportunity to differentiate and add value in that if someone's super busy and they've booked a meeting for 30 minutes and they're willing to spend 45 minutes on the call or in the meeting in person, they're clearly having a good time in this conversation and they're clearly getting something back out of it. So again, is this an, is, is this an opportunity for us to add value rather than I feel like when we ask the cliche qualifying questions, we're just sucking value from people. <clears throat> well, number one, you should be adding value in any kind of interaction you have with a prospect or customer. Um, otherwise, you're not going to move the sales process forward. Now, I think that most people are having the wrong conversations. Um, when they go meet a prospect or customers, one of the first things that they usually ask, who are you using? Do you like them? 
what are you not getting? I mean, make me sick, will you? I mean, those questions are not going to get someone's attention. Because at the end of the day, they're saying, why should I educate you on who I'm using? Because at the end of the day, I don't even know what you're about. So I want them, I have a phrase, you know, when I do my keynotes on impact, I have a phrase, don't compete, you want to create. You don't want to have a conversation around the competition because it's a zero-sum game. You want to ask, elevate the conversation to what I call as an enterprise conversation around the whole organization or around the individual as a whole if you're selling financial services. I want to find out where they're going. I want to find out what the challenges are. I want to find out what the gaps are that they don't have solved yet. When I find out those things, then I can present what I have to offer as a solution to helping them get results that they're not currently getting. This automatically differentiates me from the, com from the competition by having a different conversation. It finds out what the competition is not doing, and it makes it easier for them then to come and buy from me, especially when they have a long relationship with an existing vendor, if they realize that they're getting something better that they can't get from the current vendor. Let's take a step back here for a second, Ron, and then we'll dive back into this very conversation in itself and perhaps even the questions that we should be asking and we'll get real practical about it. When sure. does this conversation happen? Because if you ring someone up on a cold call and ask them where they want to be in five years, they're just going to put the phone down because they've not got the mental time or willpower to process this kind of... Right. So the first thing you do in a cold call or email is you're not going to ask that question. you got to give a reason for the, for, the call, for the interruption. Let me just say one thing. Um, I do a lot of reading on uh, neuroscience techniques, okay, and the latest findings. And the first thing that salespeople or professional service providers or um, entrepreneurs, whoever's listening to this show, have to realize is that the number one thing we have to take responsibility for is creating the right environment for someone to want to talk to us. What does that mean? Well, when we call up, I can call my existing customer who's on retainer with me, and I'm an interruption to him. Even though he likes me, he gets results, I just interrupted what he was doing at that moment. So we all have cortisol, and cortisol is a stress chemical, but we all have it. But the moment you call up a prospect on a cold call, you automatically raise that cortisol because of the interruption factor. What we need to do is we need to reduce that cortisol to a level and then increase the oxytocin and the um, dopamine so they can have a feel-good experience where they want to put their guard down and talk to us. Well, they're not going to do that, and that switch won't happen in their mind if we talk about our comp their comp my competitors, what they're using, because there's no value to them, and we're still a big interruption. But we have found, actually, as we put them through closed-circuit TV to see the difference, when we ask questions about where someone is going, that automatically changes the chemical balance in someone's brain. And they lower their guard because all of a sudden they're thinking about where they want to go and it's about them and they start giving us the information and it becomes a creative conversation. So in an email or a phone call or a voicemail message, what do you leave? Well, the first most messages people say is, hi, my name is Ron Carf. I'm from Car Associates and I want to talk to you about keynote speaking. Well, if you dissect that, hi, my name is Ron Carr. Is that customer focused? Or is that self-focused? It's self-focused. It's about me. I'm from Car Associates. It's self-focused. I want to speak to you about keynote speaking. It's self-focused. There's nothing in those first precious minutes about the customer. So we want to change that. We want to be all about the customer from the first get-go. We want to sit there and say, Mr. So-and-so, in today's sales environment, you know, vice presidents of sales are making three major mistakes, and I want to share strategies on how you can avoid it. Would you please give me a call? Something like that at a higher level, because most people want to be shared with. They want to say, well, yeah, what are the three mistakes? I want to find that out. You know, or, you know, Mr. So-and-so, we've just generated over, you know, half a million dollars in incremental sales for, uh, you know, uh, your competitors, and I'd like to do the same thing for you. If you can, give me a call, and I'll share with you how we did it. Something like that. Or you can even sit there and say, Mr. So-and-so, um, we find that purchasing agents in your industry are, are using a strategy that worked yesterday, but today is killing them. Let me share with you a tweak that you should be making in that strategy that's going to give you different results. Something like that. So this is happening the whole, whole every step of the process. This isn't a, a tangible 
one element segment of it. This isn't a barrier that we need to get through. This is a different way of going about the whole process, right? This is a different conversation you have throughout the entire sales cycle, yes. But you have to start it by um, the phone call, get their attention. And here's another thing. Um, most sales people just forget what the goal of each interaction is. So, for example, the goal of a call is nothing more to get the person to call you back. It's not to sell yourself. But yet they start selling themselves and they lose the customer's attention because the voicemail is too long and or they already feel they have what you're offering, so they're not going to call you back, right? If the call is to get them to call you back, say something stimulating that the person wants to call you back and say, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, in the email, if you're doing an introductory email, it's the same thing. Now, if you're going to send an email as a follow-up to a call you just had with somebody, don't waste the first line of the email saying, hi, Mr. Jones, it was such a pleasure to meet with you today. Seriously, make me vomit. People don't have time to read all this stuff, okay? And they're automatically saying, it's a nice email, I'll get to it later. That first line should be a repetition of the biggest challenge they just talked about on the phone with you. To get their attention which is important about them. So you start thinking, dear Mr. Jones, when you spoke today about the challenge of staying relevant in your marketplace, it brought up three things I wanted to share with you. Boom, boom, boom. That email will be read. And also, as we know, the subject line is critically important also. So the subject line has to have. So it's what it's about. It's about outcomes. I sell on outcomes. I don't sell features. I sell on results. So anything that we're talking about in a message, an email, even a subject line, should be outcome-based to get someone's attention. So how does all this, we've got this data, and we can perhaps dive into the specific questions as well, just to give some examples, but when we've got all this data, how do we qualify with it? Because some of these are not wishy-washy, but it's people's thoughts and opinions as opposed to I've the traditional sales questions of, I've got X dollars budget and I need to spend it by this, and I've got this specific problem. Well, number one, I never talk about money up front because if you do a good job of uh, creating opportunity in that account and, and, and uncovering needs and presenting what you have in context of what they told you about and they really want it, they'll find a way to get the money if they can. Money should be the last thing you talk about. But I am talking about the problems. I'm asking them if, I, if I'm meeting with somebody, I'm going to say, hey, thanks for allowing me to come in. Um, I know that, you know, uh, if I'm representing a cleaning service, for example, you know, for office buildings, you know, I'd go in there and I'd say to an insurance agent who owns his office, I sit there and say, hey, thanks for coming and letting me in. I, I, before I get into my cable building, I just want to ask you a critical question, if you don't mind. I go, OK, what is it? Well, you've been here for 20 years. You've obviously been very successful. What are the three images you want people walking away from here after they have finished meeting with you? What do you want your brand to be? What, what are you representing? What's the experience that you want? And believe me, they'll start talking. They'll start talking about, well, you know, we want, um, you know, uh, our customers to come in and feel comfortable in a clean environment that represents a first class operation because that's how I differentiate myself. I said, great. So you want them to feel it's a first class clean establishment. Um, do you have any challenges in keeping that environment the way you want it represented? And they'll go, sure, give me three challenges you have. Well, sometimes we have too much dust in. I got to keep dusting it up, you know, or and the cleaning people come in and they don't do this, they don't do that. I said, well, how many hours a week do you spend uh, fixing up the office so it fits the brand that you have? Oh, about an hour, you know, hour and a half. Wow, that's a lot. So that's 52 hours. What could you have done with those 52 hours if you didn't have to keep cleaning that you hired someone else to do for you? Oh, I can use that on business development. I can use it on that. So now I've just got this guy to tell me exactly what he's looking for. He's not even thinking of me as a salesman anymore. But more importantly now, we get to the next step where he's given me concrete information of what he's looking for. So now when I present my cleaning service, I'm not just presenting features. I'm, spend, I'm presenting it in context to what he just told me. You see, if we just present without asking these questions, it lands with no power. But if I find out the guy wants to keep his brand of being meticulous, first class operation, cleanliness, then I can go in and say, let me share with you our three pronged approach as a cleaning service and how at the end of the day, it's going to give you that pristine image you want your people to come into. 
Now he's going to listen to me, and I'm going to share that with him. What do you say, so Ron, was... when – sorry to interrupt you, but what do you say when someone turns around and goes, oh, I don't really know. Not, I've not really thought about that. What does that as, – as the sales professional sat opposite them, what does that tell you? So a lot of salespeople say, well, what if they don't say anything? I said, so what? Be quiet and let them come up with something. Give them time. It may be a question they haven't heard, but they'll come up with an answer. Now, by the way, numbers are really important here. You know, uh, I'm sure you've watched some law TV, you know, law shows on TV. And lawyers are very good at dictating the scope of the conversation. So we as sales execs have to realize that we also control how big the conversation can go. If I ask someone for one challenge, they may think of something, they may not. But if I ask them for three, they're definitely going to give me at least one, if not two, and hopefully three. And when they give me three, there's a better shot I got something to talk about. If I just ask for one and I can't do anything about that, I really have no room to play here. So should we be challenging them slightly? Should we be making them? Uh, should we be proactively going out of our way to make them go, oh, and actually think? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> if you don't challenge them, what's your value? You know, we need to... Look, when people buy, let's talk about the three common aspects of a sales situation. You're either calling on a customer because you want to increase a price. So you're changing the perceived value of it, what they've been buying up to now. You're trying to get a prospect to switch vendors and come to you, right? That's the pain of change. Or you're asking them to buy something that's more, expect, more expensive than the budget called for. That's a pain of change because they have to reset their value. Or you're asking them to buy a whole new product or service that they never even used before and take a risk on it. That's a pain of change. So anytime you're going with a pain of change, you have to convince them that they're going to be better off going with what you're offering than staying where they are. And in order to do that, you have to challenge the way people think. Absolutely. Because the reason I asked that question was, and this is what came to mind because I've been in this experience before, of I've asked people difficult questions, I've left that weird silence, and then I've sat on my hands and left that weird silence a little bit more, and they've still not come back with anything. And then in hindsight, they've been the wrong people to ask the questions to, or or they've disqualified themselves in that moment of they clearly have no idea about anything that I'm doing, and so there's probably lower hanging fruit that is more uh, opportunity rich to go at. Uh, so you brought up a few good points. Let's take them one at a time. Number one. If I ask them a question, there's a silence. The old saying goes, the first one who speaks loses. All right? So don't say anything. You know, um, Harvard had a, a study many years ago. They called it the monkey effect of influence. You know, who holds the monkey on the shoulders? That monkey is, 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 is as a responsibility. So if I'm giving you a question, I'm throwing it on your shoulder. If I now don't wait for you to speak and I just start speaking, I've taken it back off your shoulder and put it on my shoulder. We don't want to keep the responsibility on our shoulders. We want to keep putting it on the customer's shoulders so they keep talking to us. Number two, if they don't know the answer, give them time. That's fine. But if they don't know the answer and they're not the right person, then that gives you a great lead in to get an introduction to the right person. And they say, well, I really don't understand about this. And say, well, who do you think might? Oh, yeah, um, Joe Blow, who is um, who's the vice president of engineering. Great. Can you help me provide an introduction to Joe? so I can share this exciting news with you. And now you get elevated to where you need to be. And if for some reason it's not the right situation, it's not the right account for you, then they also did your value because they just proved to you you shouldn't be wasting your time and you should be going somewhere else and you should be thanking them and moving out with a smile on your face. Time aside here, let's assume that, <laughs> not that salespeople have a spare time, but let's assume that they've got enough time to go into an account it's a big, complex B2B deal. So there's going to be influencers in there. There's going to be end users. There's going to be the final decision maker. And perhaps there's, there's no overall um, one one individual decision maker versus the decision making party that will feed their feedback up to that individual. Should we be having these conversations with everybody or are there certain people within that complex B2B sale that you know we 100% need to be dealing with in this manner? And then there's others that it's almost like a nice to have. There is no nice to have. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with a bigger sale with more uh, influences there, you have to talk to all the influences. 
Look, you know, I'm in my own office right now. I got an assistant, but if she's not here, if you want to sell me a computer, I'm the economic buyer. I'm going to sign it. I'm the user. I'm using it. I'm the comparative buyer. I'm going to compare it. And at the end of the day, I'm my own coach because I'm making my own decision. But when you go into a big organization, there's probably different people in those roles. And you got to talk to them. What you have to do also is ask the same questions of each type of influencer to see, A, if you're getting the, right, the same answers. And if you're getting different answers, then you're finding out what's unique to each influencer that you're going to have to address. At the end of the day, not every influencer may have the power to say yes and sign a deal. That's the economic buyer. But they all have the power to say no. And our job is to reduce the amount of no's. So when the vote is taken, when we're not there, we get the majority and we're getting the deal. So, yes, you have to go to all the influence. Let me share a story with you. Um, I was brought in by a client. Uh, they had a problem. They had a $5 million uh, supply deal with a big company. I won't mention their name. The female negotiator was a very tough negotiator for, the cust for, the, for their customer. And when they gave him the deal, she thought she was being raped on price. And she said, I'm going to do it. But if you don't do your price better, we're going to find some, an alternative in the next year. So the year is coming to an end now. And they call me up and they say, oh, my gosh, she found a, a better product. Really? You need to come in and help us. So I flew in. We sat at a table. I said, how many plants do they have? They said, oh, we got about um, 15 they have. When was the last time you visited all 15? They said, a while back. Marshal your troops. Let's get everybody in going into all the plants. Let's talk to the users in the plants. Let's find out what their headaches are. Let's see what's going on, and let's see what comes up. So one salesman walked into one of the plants. He opened up the door, and the moment he got into the cement floor, he fell and landed on his face. The workers came back, and they're picking him up and cleaning him off, and they're saying, what happened? He goes, what was that box I just tripped over? They said, oh, that piece of crap? That's a product they're forcing us to use and it doesn't work. That was a product that was supposedly qualified. When we found that out, did that change our negotiating stance? Obviously it did. Users will give you information that a comparative buyer will never give you because they have different issues. And uh, the economic buyer will give you different issues compared to the economics of the organization. And you also want to find a coach. A coach is defined as somebody who for some reason, feels you're good for that organization, they want you to succeed. They may not even be involved in the, in the buying process, but they want you to succeed. And like any good coach, they won't necessarily volunteer information, but your job is to get information out of them legally, no, not confidential, that can help you figure out what your strategy should be. So yes, yes, yes. Go after all the influences and develop those relationships and reduce the amount of no's when the vote is taken. So I want to end the show, Ron, in a minute on perhaps we've done all the conversations, how we relay that back to the decision makers at the end of the sales process, you know, perhaps when proposals, when even when invoices and that are being raised um, or POs being raised, how we can accumulate all this, all the data, all the knowledge that we've got into whether it's a document, whether it's a high level conversation, whatever it is. But before that point, we have to document all of this, all these conversations. And this seems like a super simple question, but there could be profound value and it could change the way that people listening to this show go about the day-to-day -day meetings. How do we document this? Is it a case of having a piece of a pad of paper at each meeting, would you drop everything down, that it goes into a CRM and then we try and pull everything back together at the end? Or is there is there a more seamless way of doing this? Because there's so many insights that we're going to be pulling out here and it could be just one or two you know, little ones or seemingly little ones at the time that tend uh, that can end up being huge decision making uh, leverage points at the end of it. Well, you should document. I mean, you can use a piece of paper. I use Evernote. Um, I, I open up a file in Evernote and I label it the client's name or whatever. I, and it's who I spoke to. I highlight it when I need to remember, and I use that for my note taking. And I use that for my you know to develop a presentation around the issues that they have. Um, one thing to remember is, is that when you go in for the final presentation, number one, you should not start with your presentation. You should review the findings that you had, because that makes you more valuable to them. Here are my findings that I've gotten from my research. Now, before I do that, I just want to go around the room and see if there's anything I missed that's important to each of you here, because my goal is when each of you walk out, 
you've got your answer, answers to the questions you have. And so you get the additional information from them. And then you present your presentation in context to what they said in the room and to the findings. And it's laser targeted against what's important to that person. And that will help you increase your closing ratio. And I don't want to just gloss over this because I think this is a really nuanced. And I've been up against many sales professionals that haven't done this in my background in medical devices. Anything over, I think it was like 15 grand would go to tender. So it's pretty much every deal that I'd ever do. And we would we would very specifically, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know the legality of this, but we would get the procurement teams to essentially put in specifications that we had that other people didn't. So you'd go up against these people. They had no chance of winning the business because they couldn't match the specifications on the document. And they were still in there pitching and the pitches were terrible. And it was intriguing to me to get feedback of the surgeons, of the buyers, of the procurement officers on their... And obviously, you'd always try and go last. So you try and get feedback from their presentations and tailor yours towards that. But very specifically in the conversation we're having here, Ron, what should we... What insights are useful for a decision maker at that point in the process what well, should we things. go on i'm sorry um there's two two answers to the question number one um there's actually four potential parts of a sales phase you go into a customer they either have no need or they're actively in the middle of a bid or they already made a decision or they're executing on that decision one of those four things most salespeople are looking to get into the sales process when there's an active bid and it's the, too late at that time because that bid is around someone else's specs. And that's where most of the caucuses of dead salespeople are buried. <laughs> most of us should be getting in before the, the bid comes out. They should be getting in there when there's no need because then there's no guards. There's no processes to prevent against giving information. And you can start asking the what if questions. Tell me wh where are you trying to go? What are the challenges? What if you could do this? What if you could do that? And you get their attention, and then two things will one of two things will happen. They'll like, get so interested, they want to go ahead that A, they'll buy it immediately from you because you came up with the idea, or if they can have to bid, they'll go to bid, but the bid's written around your spec. So that's number one. Get in there before the bid. You mentioned medical devices. Big industry from what, that I deal with. Um, so I was called in by John Treese, who was the uh, senior vice president of Zomed Surgical at that time. It was a company that made an ear nose for ear nose and throat surgeons. They came up with a brand new machine that can cut, light, and irrigate. It was rated number one by all the technical magazines. And when he called me up to keynote his national sales meeting, I asked him, you know, what are your biggest challenges? And he goes, Well, we came up with this machine, but we can't sell it. What do you mean you can't sell it? The biggest player in the medical industry basically re-engineered what we did and they gave and they came up with theirs but they're giving the machine away for free so they can make the money on the consumables. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you want from me? Because I want the money back. I said, well, instead of just hiring me for a keynote, why don't you have me travel in a couple of cities? Let me try a new conversation, see if it works. And then when I come in, I can do a, a, a big in-depth training program, you know, for a day, day and a half, change some behaviors, and then I can still do a closing keynote. So he, he bought the deal. So I went into three cities and I was in hospitals and I was invited into the surgery, you know, to observe. And I saw the surgeons and what they were doing. And when the surgeons were done the surgery, I said to them, I said, hey, let me ask you a question. You know, as a surgeon, what's your biggest issue? You know, what are you trying to do? He goes, oh, man, you know, our profits are being taken up by the insurance. We're getting reimbursed less. I have to do more cases. And I just don't have the time to do more cases because, you know, these cases take so much time. Well, how long does it take for this case? He goes, it's about 30 minutes. Okay, now you do know that based on statistics, this machine is, is already proven to cut out five minutes from each cage. He goes, yeah, I can see that. Well, if you use this machine religiously and you did it over, um, you know, 100 cases, right? Five times 100, it's 500 minutes. How many more cases can you fit in? Or well, extrapolate it over the year. How many more cases can you do if you use the machine in every year? He goes, my God, that would give me, you know, X amount of cases and how much revenue it would be. And he would tell me. Then I took the salesperson to the hospital admin and I had the same conversation. I said, as an admin, what's your biggest challenge with the hospital? We need more revenue. How are you going to do that? We need more throughput in the operating room. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, we can shorten cases. That would be ideal. Boom. 
this machine will cut cases by five by, by five minutes. How many of these procedures do you know are being used? He goes, oh, my God, at least 500. If you would split the cost with the docs, I know you don't like to pay for the machine up front, but think about the revenue that you're giving up because you're not getting the best-in-class machine. You're buying someone else's because it's free, but it's not giving you the same return. Well, what happened was those sales reps started saying, oh, my God, there's a whole new way to sell here. They started texting to each other. So by the time I got to Jacksonville, I didn't even know this. They were ready for me. They were telling their friends, you better listen to this guy. And there was 100 people in the room. I gave them a day and a half. Did a closing keynote. At that time, Zomed was uh, capped at $96 million. They just went public. They were under a lot of pressure for the shareholders because they weren't selling. Within two months, they got back $4 million of the $8 million that they had out for capital expense. They got it all back within six months. More importantly, within two years, that major player in the industry decided to get out of the business because they couldn't compete with my client. And my client was eventually sold to Medtronic for a billion dollars. That was a 10x in value. And that all came from the basics of what we just talked about. Stop concentrating on your product. Stop concentrating on competition. Create. Find out where they're going, what the challenges are, and present in context to that. And you'll see some significant changes in your sales. I just want to, this is a great story. And I, I know there's companies from the kind of space that I was in prior to this, especially Medtronic. And I just want to point out one thing, though, because I think this is really important for the audience and myself to wrap our heads around that on the product literature, it probably said reduces procedure time by five minutes. And there's probably salespeople who went in and had conversations and told the surgeon or the doctor that we will reduce your time by five minutes. But the value is in asking the what if question first, right? And then targeting that whatever marketing literature, the, the statistics with what they've said. That's that's where the power in this lies. Yeah, the power lies in them telling you, not you telling them. You can sit there and say it's five minutes, that's fine, but they're not extrapolating anything. I'm asking them, what are you trying to accomplish? I need more cases. Why can't you have more cases? Because I don't have enough time. I'm, if I gave you five minutes per case, how many of these do you do? Over a year, he will figure it out. How would you like to get that time back? Where do I sign? That's the concept. Love it, love it. Well, with that, Ron, I've got one question, mate, that I ask everyone that comes on the show, and we'll wrap up with this. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Well, I learned all this stuff because I, I my first sales job was selling copiers against Xerox, and we didn't have as big a selection. So I, I kind of fell into this strategy on my own, and I had self-taught myself. But I think if I was a younger guy... I'm 60 today, so if I was, let's say, 25 today, what would I tell Ron Carr when he was 25? It would all be about mindset, something that you didn't want to talk about anymore after earlier shows, because I think mindset really drives it. And if I concentrate on what I want to have happen, I'll be asking a different set of questions than if I concentrated on what I feared would happen. Because in my mindset early in my career, I was doing what a lot of people do. Oh, my God, price objection. They won't buy that. I don't Oh, my God, I don't have a slice and dice that so they're not going to buy it. Oh, my God, I'm a small company. Why are they going to do it? It's the mindset. So I would definitely be uh, giving myself a little pep talk on the mindset and, um, and getting myself on the right uh, footing so I can have the right kind of conversations with my clients. How did you learn this? Is this books? Is it mentors? Is it just life experience? Because there's a bunch of 25-year-olds listening right now who are going, Oh crap! I'm scared of objections. I handled them somewhat well, but you know, people, especially professional buyers, they can smell that little bit of fear when they throw the same objection that they've thrown to five other vendors at you, and that's a that's almost a bargaining tool for them to to try and nail you on price after the fact. They definitely can sense fear, and also if you have a a weak pipeline and you're struggling, they'll sense that because you're discounting and all that, and they'll take advantage of you. The best way to be strong is to have a full pipeline, but that's a separate discussion. Um, I think people have just have to realize, you know, stop, stop trying to go in and sell something to somebody because we all have a connotation what sales means. It means we do all the talking, we truly do all the pushing. Go have a conversation. Go have a conversation about where they're going. Pretend you're talking to a friend and you're saying, hey, where are you going? What are your challenges? You know, what would it mean to you if you can fix that? And then you bring in how you can help them and you're targeted to that. Just have a conversation. Stop, stop trying to sell something to somebody. And I think you'll see a dramatic uh, difference in one's fear level. 
but also one's ability to go in and have better conversations. Amazing stuff. Well, with that, and that's the perfect way to wrap up this conversation, Ron. Tell us a little bit about the book. Tell us where we can find out more about you. And then tell us a little bit about the impact moments that you're putting out as well. Sure. So uh, Lead, Sell It, Get Out of the Way has been a book that's been out for a few years. It's been a CEO bestseller. It's still selling really well. And it has a lot of concepts we just talked about. So you can get that on Amazon at a discount. It's Lead, Sell, or Get Out of the Way. Um, I myself, like everybody else, you know, I've had some challenges. You know, I had a couple back surgeries that put me down for a year. And while I was down, I was saying, what's my value to my clients? You know, I, I also run a chief revenue officer mastermind group, CEOs of small to mid-sized high growth companies that I mentor over a period of years. And I, I asked all those CEOs, what's my value to you? Do you see me strictly in sales, leadership? What do you see? And they all said, you're more than sales, you're more than leadership, you're helping us change the way we think at home and business. You're impacting our lives. So that became my new brand, Impact, the Art and Science of Achieving Significant Results. So we have online right now in the store, roncar.com. And by the way, car is spelled K-A-R-R. So it's roncar.com. You can go to the store and you can get the Selling with Impact on um, a 15-video module series that goes into much more detail or the 10-module on Leading with Impact. But something really new that we're doing that's not even out yet, we're, we're doing the samples right now. One of the things that I get from my clients as an issue and what people are looking for is consistency of message. You know, how do we, because we read a book one time, it goes on a bookshelf, we listen to a video or watch it, it goes away. How do we get consistency of message to remind us? So we start, we created this new concept called Impact Moments. It's a weekly video, two and a half minutes, wherever I am on location, I'm taking my iPhone out and I'm relating it to where I am and I'm giving a solid sales tip and strategy for that week. And a company can buy it and we'll logo it on, we'll put a, their logo on it and they can share with all their employees or their customers. And it's an annual subscription, one a week, it's 52 videos. And uh, we're just releasing that product, a very exciting um, concept. So if you're interested in getting that for your uh, salespeople or even giving value to your customers, just uh, email me, ron at roncard.com, and I'll share more about that. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes to this episode of salesmanpodcast.com. With that, Ron, I want to thank you for your time, your insights on this, and I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. I wish you and your listeners all the best. 